Uh, this, as Ed introduced to you, I'm sure I heard a little bit when I come in, uh, this bias voltage uh, circuit integrity, that's kind of what we were talking about yesterday. We talked about the input side, and today I want to talk about the output side. This is kind of a work in progress, this particular class for me. So this is just something I'm working on, you know, kind of um, adding things as I go. This is the second time I've taught through it, and I just wanted to add some more stuff for you guys this morning. So that's where we are. All right, so bias voltage, and again, this is the output side we're talking about, so we're just gonna jump right into it. GM fuel pump relay testing is the title of it. This is on YouTube, this is where these Next few slides come from, I wanna talk about this bias voltage we saw on this fuel pump circuit. We're gonna tie in some basic concepts as well as far as power and ground side switching, okay? Simple circuit, this is taken from the video itself. I was drawing on the board. It's a basic uh, fuel pump relay circuit. This is a GM design. And uh, let's just talk about this for a second. When we talk about output controls, we're talking about the computer switching a device on and off. Okay, the device that the computer is switching on and off in this case would be the relay and it would be the control side of the relay. So I always call this the control and this is the load. I don't know, there's other terms used for these. I don't know if you use control and load, Ed, when you talk about relays. So the control side makes a magnetic field, load side carries the current for the device. Okay, my fuel pump motor doesn't have a ground in this diagram, so it's never gonna run. That's not relevant if you're um, OCD. Sometimes I get a little OCD, so. Okay, now it, now it can run. All right, that wasn't the point of the, of the picture. Um, so control side, we wanna focus on that. What type of driver uh, is this? Is the computer switching the power or is it switching the ground? It's switching the power, how do you know that? I mean. Yeah, okay, I should probably have done this. I probably should have blocked this off because a lot of our diagrams will only give you that. It'll say the only designation you have inside of the computer uh, on a wiring diagram is it'll say FP uh, control. Or actually, it'll, it'll, it might even be uh, cryptic writing like FP uh, CN, uh, I'm trying to think of the abbreviations I've seen, TL maybe? You're like, what's that? What is that? That doesn't help me. So what told, if, if that wasn't there, I don't know, were you looking inside the computer when you answered that? Good man, where were you looking? Down here? Yeah. So you got lucky on your, on your, uh, on your answer then. Anything, anything down here does not tell us what's in here. So my question is, how is the computer controlling this relay? So our focus, our focus then would be on the control side of the circuit. And, and you had mentioned, you were right in your answer, but you had mentioned the load side of the circuit and the switching, and it is switching power to the fuel pump. You saw that, but my question was on the control side. This is my key right here. It's power side switch. It's a power side switch fuel pump circuit. I was looking for control side. How's the computer controlling this relay? This is chapter three material. Um, I, I really feel like chapters two and three are the most important chapters that I've written in that book. So chapter three, this is a uh, power side switched component. And how do we know that? With no information inside the computer, how you know that is you follow the wire that doesn't go to the computer. That guy right there tells you what this circuit needs. If it has a ground all the time, then what does it need? It needs a power. If this is a coil of wire that makes a magnetic field, it needs to have current flow to make that magnetic field. We have a ground, so we need to apply a power. And so what we know, looking at this circuit, the computer switches power on to this relay. No question about it, this is a power side switch circuit. If this went to a fuse externally, and it was listed like that, maybe you had a positive symbol there, then what type of circuit is this? And there's two terms that I'll give you them that I use, uh, pull up and pull down circuitry uh, is easily mixed up in terminology and I like to talk about that on the input side. So here's the two terms that I prefer you use is uh, power and ground side switching or power and ground side controlled. So we said the last one was power side switched, meaning the computer switches power to that circuit. This one being that I'm now going externally to a fuse. So I followed my diagram. Maybe it goes to multiple other components. It doesn't matter. Um, the fact is one leg goes to a fuse, tells you that's the hot side. So what's the other side of that coil need? We know this is power. What does this side need? It needs a ground. What is the computer doing with this circuit? It's switching the ground. So this is ground side switch, ground side controlled. There's some other terms that you guys would hear um, is low side drivers, high side drivers. 
So a low side driver is a ground side switched driver. Uh, we're switching low, switching down, grounding the circuit, low side driver. What's a high side driver? You're switching to battery voltage, high side, power. So you'll hear those terms too. Ground side switched, power side switched, ground side controlled, power side controlled, load side driver, high side driver. I do not want you guys to apply the terms pull up and pull down to the outputs because the input side, uh, we apply those terms. And the only reason I'm, I've been critical of my students over the years is I just don't want you getting the inputs and output circuits mixed up in your mind. So that's why I don't like to use pull up and pull down. You could make the argument that you can apply those terms at times here, but I just prefer when we're learning about this, that we, we stay away from the terms pull up and pull down when we're talking about outputs, okay? Stay with me here with this relay. It's basic circuit, right? We need to make a magnetic field. The computer is gonna uh, send a small uh, voltage on the base of this transistor, which allows this computer to switch power to this coil. It has a ground all the time, so we have current flow. It makes a magnetic field, pulls the switch closed, fuel pump runs, basic circuit. Along with that, if this driver is off, what would be the voltage? This is important for where we're going. What is the voltage if we put a voltmeter here to ground with this driver off in, that, in this location out here? What do we got? This driver being off, so this is 12 here, which would be my source in this case. And that 12 volts cannot make it through this transistor. This is basically a diode right now with that base off. There's no voltage on that leg. This entire circuit from here over is extended and is connected to what? Yeah, this is gonna be zero volts right now in this location. Before that driver turns on, this is important, it will be zero volts. When this driver turns on, the computer, what it does is it sends a small voltage, the base of that transistor, maybe a volt, a very, very low current, which allows this transistor to switch on and then it forces that voltage, that 12 volts that was on the, um, on the collector side, transfers through to the emitter. And so we now have 12 volts here. And then this voltage in that location on that relay is gonna switch up to 12 volts. And now that relay energizes, it clicks, fuel pump runs. If there's any questions here, it's gonna get a little bit more confusing. So let's make sure we have all of our baseline stuff here first. What if I um, didn't use a voltmeter? Let's say I'm using a test light. So let's plug that in here. Let's put a test light here to ground. And what will that look like? Circuit off, test light lit or not? Yeah, not lit, good. Circuit off, test light's not lit, turn this circuit on so the driver allows voltage through and test light lights. Everybody good with that? Okay, next page. Let's check it. Notice I, I have, well actually focus down here where my arrow is. It's kind of tough to see this. I took this from the video. I have the, the fuel pump relays right here. So I just lifted the relay just a bit so I could access that pin, the control pin. Which one am I on? I'm measuring right here with my voltmeter connected to ground. I just lifted that up and I'm touching on that pin. And the circuit is off. Relay plugged in, circuit off. That makes sense, this is what it should be. Circuit's off, got no voltage there. Watch this. Unplug the relay, same pin. This would be the WTF moment you mentioned earlier. There's something weird going on with this circuit. This, this, this shouldn't be here. This, Circuit is still off. The computer's not turning the driver on. If you're thinking to get a perspective, I have 12 volts measured in that location right there with the relay now removed. The driver is still off. What is our lesson today? What's the topic? Bias voltage. So I don't know if it's your first time seeing it, but this is a bias voltage that is on this circuit. And notice I drew something a little extra in this picture that I intentionally left out at the beginning. I left it out at the beginning because I didn't want your eyes focused there at all. I wanted your eyes focused on a regular circuit. And in fact, when you look at wiring diagrams, I told you already, they don't give you that information, do they? So am I gonna have this information as I'm continuing to troubleshoot? I am not. So in your mind now, you better be thinking about that guy that's in there. This is a bias voltage that is being sent from the computer to that device and it's used for trouble code diagnostics. The computer is able to recognize opens and shorts in a circuit before it ever even turns it on. 
Okay, we can recognize opens and shorts when we turn it on, compare voltage, turn it off, compare amperage, voltage, whatever, but it's a way the computer can recognize faults in circuits without ever even turning it on. How many of you have ever left an ABS wheel speed sensor unplugged? It's just a two pin ABS wheel speed sensor, a magnetic type to be clear, not the digital newer types that have a uh, reference voltage supplied from the computer or power supplied from the computer. I'm talking about the type that makes its own voltage, an AC sine wave, old school design. You unplug that ABS wheel speed sensor, the car is still up in the air. You didn't even take it on a test drive yet and you start the car up, the wheels aren't turning. Well, I guess the car's not up in the air anymore unless you climbed up on the rack, sorry about that. But you put the car down, you went inside, you start the car and it's flagging a code for the wheel speed sensor. How in the hell does it know the wheel speed sensor is not plugged in when you didn't even drive the car yet? What do you think they're running on those ABS wheel speed sensors? Bias voltage. So you see we could have even expanded on the input side of bias voltage yesterday and included ABS wheel speed sensors. And I could have included oxygen sensors. I could have included NOx sensors. And so over the next six months as I work on this class, when I put this together for the public, we're gonna probably do that. And I'm gonna add those other pieces to the input side. But anyway, uh, we're dealing with a bias here and uh, let's learn about it a little bit more. We can see uh, unplugged, we have no voltage and then plugged in, we have voltage. So let's, let's talk about this and make sure we're clear where this is coming from. This 12 volts that we're reading in this location is not coming from the source. Remember, this is blocked right now. Like picture that as a blocked diode. We have no voltage coming through that transistor right now. That circuit is off. We have another source. I drew it just as a positive sign because this bias voltage can be two volts, three volts, five volts, 12 volts, depends on the manufacturer on what they're sending on that circuit. And as you, you're gonna see through this lesson, we, we see some real wacky type bias stuff in here. Um, so I just drew it as a plus symbol. In this case, it's, it definitely is 12. So it's 12 volts from here. It's coming through a resistor. Tries to come this way. Can it go that way? Nope. Goes over this way. And it reads 12. This is unplugged. That's important. Unplugged. We got 12. Why do we have 12? No current flow, no voltage drop. Plugged in, circuits off. That same 12 volts is here. It does come through the resistor. It is still blocked, so this 12 volts is isolated. Why do we read zero volts in this location with it plugged in? Unplugged, we got 12. Plugged in, we have zero. It is a completed circuit. We have a path through this coil to ground. It is not enough to energize and make a magnetic field and close that switch. Is there current flow though taking place on this circuit? There is, to have a voltage drop, to have this 12 volts drop down to zero volts, there has to be current flow, there has to be. But it's not enough current flow to energize that coil. Relay coils need about 100 milliamps, 150 milliamps to energize and make a magnetic field. And I wouldn't even be able to measure the current flow on this. It'd be in the microamp range. So what's that tell us about how high of a resistor is that in there? Is it a low resistor or is it a really, really high resistor? Yeah, super high. You're probably talking 100K ohms, probably. 100,000 ohm resistor uh, that's living in, in that location. Questions on that part. It's kind of weird to think about. What we're talking about is a source going through a resistor going through another resistor to ground and we're measuring the voltage in between two resistors. That's exactly what we're doing right there. Where is my voltmeter connected? Between two resistors. So a good visual for you guys, forget the math. I always like this visual. Picture this as a hose and there's water flowing through this hose right now. Two kinks in a hose, right? Um, have power, have a resistor, another resistor going to ground. I have a voltmeter connected between the two. If I squeeze that resistor tighter, what does the voltage or pressure do between the two? It's gonna go down. If I come over here and squeeze that one tighter, what's the pressure do? Just picture a hose and two kinks and it goes up, it goes up. So that's kind of a side note here when we're talking about resistance is a resistance problem can cause a voltage rise. 
a resistance problem can cause a voltage drop. It depends on where you're measuring and it depends on the circuit. A voltage rise, uh, the perspective here would be this circuit here maybe would be your bad ground. What does a bad ground look like? If this is the device we're trying to run and this resistor should not be there, that's what your bad ground does. That's what your ground to ground voltage drop test shows you. A high voltage reading on the ground is a backup of pressure. You have a bad ground, go find it. That's, that would be an unwanted ground. This right here is also how your thermistor circuits work. Temperature sensors work like this. This one is inside the computer. This one is your thermistor outside the computer. And that's why when you have high resistance, squeeze it tighter, you have high voltage. It's very weird thinking about it like that because we learn electrical, we think high resistance, it's gonna be low voltage. Not all the time, but what can we equate? High resistance will be lower current flow all the time. Well, there's a variable there too. I'm not talking about that. DC electric motors and counter electric motor force, and that's for a different subject. Scratch that. Uh, high resistance, low current. Low resistance, high current. We can say that every time. Asterisk. I just can't bring myself to say that. Every, always, never. Those terms, the longer I teach, the longer I realize I can't say always, never. And there's always a variable. Yeah, I like that uh, phrase. <laughs> yeah. Squeeze that resistor and this outside one, pressure's gonna rise. It's very weird to think about when you're first learning electricity, right? A, a resistance rise equals a voltage rise. That's what you have going on there. Um, and that's what we have going on here. So if, if this internal resistor, that's this guy, is super high resistance uh, compared to the external, can you guys picture that if I really jack this one up real high and this one's barely anything at all, that most of my pressure, if not all, is gonna drop across that first one. And that second one is really just allowing that current flow to, to come out unrestricted because there's such little current there that it's not enough to cause any kind of pressure rise and it just essentially just trickles out of that circuit. And that's why with the relay plugged in, we have zero volts in that location. It has everything to do with the two resistors themselves and what they are. And what do we have? A super high one inside and a super low one outside. That's what we got. What happens when I take that relay out? So in this picture, I was drawing on the wrong one. The relay is removed. It would be the top picture. This is the one that was reading zero. So we have that there. And this one, sorry about that. Maybe a little confusing as I'm talking. Uh, this one's reading 12. Why does that happen? Why do we have 12 here? Because you've taken the ground path away. And what happens? We still have voltage that comes through, but there's no current flow and it kind of trickles through and then fills this leg up with pressure. That's equal to the source. This is electricity 101. That's what we got. Tells you your control wire is good enough. Yes, it does. That's where we're going with this. It's exactly right. It's exactly right. If I have an in-op fuel pump and it's not working and I have no control and I'm, the flow chart's telling me to measure resistance from the computer to the device and make sure there's no opens and shorts and I understand there's bias voltage here, I'm not doing that. If I have zero all the time and no control, one of our possibilities here, well, let's name them. So just face value, we're troubleshooting this fuel pump circuit and I have zero volts there all the time. It never turns on. I crank the engine over, turn the key on, it never turns on. What's my variables? Where are we going? Faulty computer, faulty driver, right? Driver's not working. Maybe I have a computer power or ground problem that the computer's never turning on. It's never coming to life. Maybe I have a shorted five volt reference circuit that's pulled everything down and that computer's dead and it can't talk to itself within the board and it doesn't do anything. Maybe I have no RPM signal, so I have a cam crank sensor issue I'm cranking it over and I see zero volts there all the time and I forgot to check the key on prime. So I missed that moment because it only happens for a second or two when you first turn the key on, you get a prime. And by the way, another variable, not all cars have primes, so we can't use that test as foolproof. But the fact is we crank it over, we have no voltage. So we got RPM signals we gotta look at, power and grounds we gotta look at, five volt reference we gotta look at, before we can say, hey, that computer's bad and that doesn't even count we missed some stuff, didn't we? Opens and shorts in that circuit right there, right? Could we have an open in that wire right there, giving me zero volts in that location all the time? Absolutely. Could we have a short to ground 
giving me zero volts there all the time. Yes. By the way, if you have a short to ground on a power side switch circuit, what is no longer functioning? Think about it. If that driver turns on and sends voltage through and there's no more resistance, it goes straight to ground, that driver no longer lives in that computer. So a short to ground is also gonna fry the driver. We have a lot to think about, don't we, when we're troubleshooting this circuit. These are standard things that we think about and this will be able to be on the forefront of your mind the more you touch these cars. Where we are with this, starting there, zero volts, right? Relay plugged in, unplug the relay. I'm measuring 12 in that location. What's that tell us about our control wire opens and shorts? We've at least eliminated that part. We have other things to think about, the other ones that I mentioned. Cam, crank, 5 volt ref, power and ground of the computer. But how's my control wire? I'm not doing any opens and short circuit tests. And there would be some that argue, well, that's not really a load on the circuit. You'd be right. Neither is an ohm meter. Neither is an ohm meter. That bias is putting just as much stress on that circuit as an ohm meter would. So is that any less accurate than your ohm meter? Absolutely not. There would be others that may argue, well, that doesn't necessarily mean the wire is good. You're right. I mean, we're not loading that circuit. It'd be the same argument as me taking that wire, disconnect, here's your ohm test, disconnecting the computer, disconnecting the relay, and taking an ohm meter and going from end to end. We saw how low the voltage was yesterday on ohm meters, right? 0 0.4, 0 0.2 of a volt. And then we saw on the, on the other meter, I had a 1.2 volt on my lowest scale. So that did load the circuit a little more. Current flow is not measurable. My point is, are we really loading that wire with the ohm meter? Of course not. Is there other tests we want to do? Yes, whenever it comes to especially calling a bad computer. But this is preliminary type stuff. I'm not checking the wiring if, I, if it's good there. Unplug it, you got bias, you're done. Move on, next step. Let's keep going just to understand the circuit. Right now, plugged in, I'm cranking the engine over. Why are we reading 10.8? System voltage, starters drawing a whole mess of current, 10.8 volts in a cranking situation is not a problem. Did that driver turn on for this relay? Can we be confident in that? I think we can say yes. In fact, we can hear the relay click at that moment in time over top of the starter motor if you're lucky. So engine cranking, circuit on voltage. I just wanted to compare the same thing, same terminal, relay removed, engine cranking again. Do we have voltage there? We do, both plugged in and unplugged. We have voltage there. Now, to explain that, we'll just go back to this again. This driver, when it turns on, it sends 12 volts in this direction. There is no resistor that we're talking about anymore. It is here. You still have 12 coming this way too, but that's not a factor. 12 volts in this location, is there any resistance here? Any resistance that you see in that leg other than the transistor itself? I don't see any. So if I crank the engine over and that driver turns on, regardless if I have the relay plugged in like it's showing you in the picture or unplugged, I'm gonna see that 10.8 volts. Does everyone understand that? And what's the difference with this 12 volts as opposed to this 12 volts? And why we don't see that unplugged, we have 12 plugged in, we have zero when it's the bias, but when the driver's on, we have 12 in either, either time. And the answer is that guy right there. That's that resistor. Yes, sir. Maybe I'm overthinking this stuff. By showing the 10.8, that proves that the driver is good. Yeah. When cranking, if it still showed the 12 volt, would that just be the bias voltage there saying that that transistor inside is not good? So I could go ahead and get them or at least get to the point where- That's a great question. That no, that's a great question. I think I can answer that. The key, Ed, is if you're going to judge that voltage you're seeing, because I don't know. That's a great question. I don't know that that 10.9 that I'm reading right there with the relay removed, I really don't know if that's the bias line or the driver has turned on. That's a great question. I don't. What's the key? I, I'm not going to say the driver turned on and that control circuit's good Unless what? Here's the key right here. Here's the key. Where is that relay in that test? It's part of the circuit. I have that coil in there. I know that that's my load. And the fact that that relay is installed and I'm maintaining that voltage is telling me that's the driver that has turned on. That is not the bias voltage. And in this test, I'm showing the same thing. I know the driver's on, hypothetically, that driver is on 
But I don't know by that test alone, it's a great question. I don't know by that test alone if that's bias I'm looking at because the relay is removed or if that driver has turned on. Does everyone understand that? Right. All right, so what if the re so it's a great question. What if the relay is messed up? What if the relay is like melted? It doesn't have to, I hope you guys are visualizing this. It doesn't have to be just a simple relay circuit. It's any output. Name it, light bulbs, solenoids, relays. Uh, electric motors, any output circuit, it is the exact same thought process that we're doing right here. This is not just one little fuel pump relay circuit. This is everything. These same concepts. Loaded circuit is key. So if the output is melted, destroyed, missing, tampered with, broken, what do we do? Let's substitute the output with our test light. This is where you want to have an incandescent test light. This is where any manufacturer that's gonna to say to you, you should never use an incandescent test light on troubleshooting uh, computer controlled systems, they have no idea what they're talking about. And I can say that and look everyone straight in the face and say, that is a flat out lie. It's a flat out lie. Here's why. If that output is broken, missing, damaged, destroyed, don't we have to check to make sure that that driver is still okay? If this is a power side switch circuit, which it is, and something happened with this guy where it melted and it allowed that current flow to go straight to ground. I told you guys, what happens to that driver? It no longer functions. And sure, your visual inspection and your code read put you in the right direction and you're like, oh, that, that device is definitely bad. It's laying on the exhaust manifold and it's melted. It's a freaking pancake. It's supposed to be not looking like that, whatever output device it is. Is that driver okay? Before you sell that job, you know it needs that output. Before you sell that job, should we make sure the driver's good? Let's say that that output, let's put some numbers behind it. Let's say that output is something astronomical. Maybe it's six, seven, $800 output device that's melted, destroyed. Customer pays for the diagnosis, pays for that output. You sold him, so maybe he's close to $1,000 with labor and, and all that. And when you're done, what do you find out? Oh, shit. that freaking driver's bad in that computer. How much is the computer? Let's just put some astronomical numbers there. That's a $2,000 computer. I'm sorry, Mr. Customer, you just spent $1,000, but now you need $2,000 more. And most of the time when that happens to a customer, it means the technician blew the call the first time and it never needed the first part and now it needs this part and that's parts changers, right? But in this scenario, you guys understand that you were right, it needed the output. You were right in the repair, but you missed it. You missed it, you didn't check the driver. What this should have been is you put a test light in there, I'm gonna show you, we're gonna test that thing, and then we condemn the driver up front. It should have been first call, first repair order should have said, you need $3,000 in repairs. That's how the job should have been sold. And then the customer can say yes or no, they're prepared, they're prepared up front. It's not, I spend a thousand here and I gotta keep going, otherwise I just wasted a thousand, so I gotta spend 2,000 more. You have to prepare your customers. Say, no, I'm sorry, you need $3,000. You need this output because it melted. When it melted, it's a power side switch circuit and it cooked that driver in the computer and you have the documentation to show it. That customer might not believe you. They might think you're a thief and they might leave. I've seen that too. $3,000, you're crazy. I'm not spending that money. So where's he go? They go and, and maybe the garage, they take it to, they're like, ah, we're just, it just needs this part. So it's a thousand. Oh, great. That's great. That guy was trying to rip me off. $3,000. That's ridiculous. Fast forward. What happens? He spends a thousand. You know, it's not going to fix it. What, what light's coming back on? Same light, same check engine light, same code is there. And then that guy says to himself, oh, that guy was right after he goes back and guess where he'll probably bring his next car to you, even though he left you. This is what I've seen. This is what I see in the field. So don't be too hard on your customers when they're angry and they leave because he might be back. Just be like, okay, yes, sir. No, you know, no, sir. No, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Let them go. Have a nice day. You'll see him back. If you're honest, integrity, you can troubleshoot. They'll come back. They'll come back no matter how they are to you. Okay. Life lesson there. You guys with me on, on what I want to do though? I want to make sure, Ed, your question, is that driver okay? Let's say the relay was melted. Let's put a test light in there. And this is just further showing you guys bias voltage and how this works. Test light in hand, this is one of my students. I have my voltmeter in that same control pin. I'm reading that bias voltage unplugged. 
Watch what happens as soon as we stick the test light on it. This is an incandescent test light connected to ground, acting as the relay coil. Notice it won't even light the test light, right? A biased voltage comes through a very high ohm resistor. Is it gonna light a test light? You'd think 12 volts. Oh yeah, 12 volts, that's gonna light my test light. Nope, but what do we see? Zero volts. No test light, what do we see? 12. Same analogy. Very, very, very high ohm resistor inside, very low ohm resistor outside compared to the inside one, where's all the pressure drop? All the pressure drops on the inside one. Is there any pressure or voltage left to light the test light? No, there is not. Same way, there was no voltage pressure left to energize the relay coil and make it do its job. How about an LED test light? Do you guys see where an LED test light could probably get us in trouble if we would troubleshoot this circuit? I'll bet you that bias voltage right there would probably light an LED test light. And so I'm troubleshooting it, trying to figure out if the driver's working or not. Your question, how do we know? Is that bias the driver that turned on or is it uh, bias voltage, right? I don't, th did I say that right? I think I did. LED test light, that LED might be glowing. You might see it glow brighter when you crank it, but if you weren't paying attention, you'd be like, man, that, that circuit's good. LED test lights will get you in trouble. That's why I don't use them in troubleshooting. Incandescent only when I'm troubleshooting. If I know specifically I'm going for something like our, our circuit integrity where we're putting voltage in on a wire, going to the computer and seeing its response, I know about that LED test light. I know it's gonna be lower voltage. I'm using it in a different application. If I'm troubleshooting, LED test light is nowhere near my hands, ever. And yet they say they're computer safe and we should have a computer safe test light. And no, no, no. Leave that LED test light in your freaking toolbox because you're gonna make some bad calls if you're using it. You guys that use power probes, I like a power probe. It's a great tool in the wrong hands. Number one, it's a dangerous tool. You can fry things, jumper wire, just like a jumper wire. I don't wanna go on that tangent. Uh, it has LED lights is my point. You have a red LED for power and a green LED for ground and people rely on those for troubleshooting. You gotta be kidding me. Don't. It's an indicator, gives you guidance. Don't rely on it. Incandescent test lights, your friend. Same, same thing, disconnected. Relay, cranking the engine over. What do we see? My light's lit. That's a different voltage, isn't it? That's a different voltage. So back up to this one, Ed. You know, 10 volts. 10 volts on that, is that, is that the bias or not? Well, let's do this. That's not bias. That driver's good, that wire's good. Is that circuit loaded now too? Can we, can we make the argument for the naysayers that say, well, the bias voltage really doesn't load the circuit. You're right, neither does the ohm meter, but is that a good guide? Yes, my wiring is intact. It's not shorted to ground, it's not open. Could there be resistance in it? Okay, maybe. How about now? What do you think? It lights my test light, no problem. It's gonna have no problem energizing that relay coil, right? There's arguments there too, but this is a good guy. This is what I do all the time. These, these, these procedures over and over and over and over again. Same circuit, same design, not same circuit, same thought process on like a hundred different circuits on all cars, all years, all makes, all models. Doesn't matter if it's a 1982 with the first computer or a 2020 with 60 computers, it's the same exact thought process and procedures, okay? Yeah, so I think I just, em I emphasized all of this already with you guys, just with drawings. Um, this page for you math guys would be in chapter seven. This is, uh, in, you don't have to turn there, just look up at the picture. This is just showing voltage drops and uh, uh, resistance in a circuit. And I use this to teach thermistor circuits and why when the thermistor voltage uh, or resistance is high is the voltage high and why when the thermistor uh, resistance is low is the voltage low, it's very weird. And so I just put math in there just to show you uh, any math guys there that need numbers. Here's your numbers. A uh, drop in resistance here uh, equals a rise in voltage here. So what did I do? I let it go. What did we do? Let more uh, current in, voltage rise. A drop in resistance here um, equals a voltage rise in here. Wait, did I say that right? A drop in 
you know what, forget the math. I already did this with you guys. If you want the numbers, they're good. I've taught through this page for years. That is there for some guys that are like, I need to see the numbers, I need to see Ohm's Law, and so I put that in there for any of the guys that are like, I need numbers. Well, there's your numbers. I don't need them. I like my hose analogy better. Let's keep moving. Everybody comfortable with that? Okay. Uh, the ugly cobalt. This is a good one. You guys need a break first? Let's take a break. When you come back, we'll do this cobalt. 